Hello and welcome to this special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, Stuart Charles gives tips and advice to improve nutrient use efficiency on Irish dairy farms. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Let's Talk Dairy for the 21st of January. Um, I hope you enjoyed the those of you that joined in last week, um, that you got value out of the interesting information that came from the um, Once a Day conference. And apologies to anybody for any confusion in relation to the registration process, the fact that it was set up separately. So in future, we'll be trying to run everything um, on the Thursday morning. Anything that's gone through the Let's Talk Dairy headline will say or um, will be accessible through this normal link and you should get in your normal email on a Wednesday and a Thursday to remind you of it. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the whole spring nitrogen strategy um, for 2021. I suppose in reality it's not really changed all that much I would say myself uh, from the point of view of the, the advice that I've been ad- issuing with the last number of years in particular. Um, I don't think there's a whole change, a massive change in what we'd be advocating, but it's probably just timely to give people a few reminders and pointers in relation to it, I suppose, just to, uh, we have to be very, very, very conscious of the whole perception in relation to water quality and what we're doing and when we're doing it now, and in particularly on the shoulders of the year. Uh, So I suppose the the slurry deadline obviously lifted here in Cork on the 13th of January, which was uh, just over a week ago, has lifted in the Limerick region um, and we'll say in the the B B zone, I suppose, uh, throughout the country on um, last Saturday, I think it was. And then the north of the country is still waiting for that slurry deadline to be lifted. So I suppose just uh, before I, I... go into a few slides in relation to the whole background about chemical nitrogen, I suppose, and the nitrogen strategy for um, the spring. Just to remind you again of, if you haven't heard it, you must be hiding under a rock at this stage. There's been a lot of talk about buffer zones in the last couple of weeks because of their importance in relation to slurry spreading uh, following the close period. So there's an, an, an automatic buffer zone of five meters required when spreading slurry at any stage of the year. And that's increased to 10 meters two weeks either side of the close period. So it's of particular importance, I suppose, uh, at this time of the year in particular, because there probably isn't a huge amount of slurry necessarily has to be spread there before the close period. Um, but just to be aware of that, and I suppose the vast majority of dribble bars that I see out in the, on the roads are tending to be in the region of seven and a half to eight meters wide. Uh, the comment that I hear coming back from contractors and guys that are driving for guys for contractors is that that's the most optimum from the point of view of not turning back on yourself um, when you're using a dribble bar. So that tends to be the one that's out there the vast majority of times. So bear in mind that you're actually staying from out from a stream or a river more than the full width of the the um, the dribble bar from that point of view in terms of that buffer zone that we're talking about. Now that throws up its own uh, issues, I suppose, maybe in terms of uh, some fields. I know guys have been on to me in relation to having some very narrow fields with dikes at both sides. What do they do there? I suppose the only advice that you can give there is that you try to maybe hold off putting out the slurry. You could argue that maybe in land like that, there, there's justification for holding off putting out the slurry anyway. If there's um, but just that there are narrow strips maybe where the 10 metre buffer zone on either side makes it very tricky to spread slurry in a strip. You either have to skip the slurry there or maybe wait until the two weeks are up that you can go that little bit closer. But I think uh, we just have to be very aware. Weather conditions are only so-so at the moment. Um, and I think people need to maybe consider for 2021, 2022 season ahead, if you've been under pressure from slurry uh, point of view for this winter past, are there things that you can do? And I'm not saying that you need to build more storage necessarily, but are there things that you can do within the yard that will maximize the storage capacity that you have on the farm? Um, So we do come across situations when we walk into farms where, uh, and this is a complacency thing, uh, it happens to everybody, uh, shoots broken maybe, and and rainwater getting into tanks, get some very heavy outbursts of rain from time to time, and they tend to fill tanks quite quickly. And there's nothing worse than a closed period to see a tank filling faster uh, because of rainwater going into it. 
So just to be aware of those kind of things and that there are little things that people can do, uh, dairy washings in particular for uh, from milking parlours are creating a, a lot of, that of issues around storage, I would say. If they're stored separately, they don't have to be stored for as long. So 15 days storage is a requirement for any new facilities that are built and 10 days was the previous requirement. So if, you're, if you don't, if you have adequate storage for your soil water, uh, in terms of the 10 days, um, that's okay. But if you're building any new, you have to facilitate 15 days into the future. So I would say that the people should just look at the options that they have around washing yards and so forth. And can that be held in a different tank maybe that would spare a, a serious amount of capacity in slurry tanks? Because if it goes in, mixes with slurry, it's classified as slurry and it needs to be stored for the full storage period, depending on where you are in the country. So just there, I suppose, a little bit of housekeeping things. And look, if you talk, if we look back at what Marion and um, Nolik have covered there in the last couple of weeks in terms of planning and reviewing stuff, that plan PL or PDR uh, theory that Marion would have introduced, which is plan, do, review. So we've gone through our winter period. Uh, we've done what we've done basically and now we need to review that and it'll be no different we'll say when we get to the end of the calving season we'll be suggesting that people just take a moment to consider their situation how did it go what could have gone better what can we do better to make life easier or make things happen better in 2022 and the same is true of the slurry storage situation so if you've been under pressure from a storage point of view just to review where did the pressures where was the pressure point Maybe it could be storage in some farms, but as I said, in a lot of cases, we do see situations where there's tanks getting full as a result of just basically clean water getting turned into them or being turned into them by accident or whatever. So that's uh, that's the time to do that is when it's fresh in your mind. Um, because as I said, complacency kind of falls into place then. So in what I see generally is a person knows that a shoot gets broken, but you walk past it a couple of times a day maybe and you, you know that, and you see the shoot every time it rains that it's overflowing or is leaking water to the tank, but people just get used to it. It's a habituation basically, so they don't uh, get it resolved and obviously that creates problems then when you do get heavy rain during a closed period and it's gone into the tank and your tank is filling up. So I'm just going to share a presentation which you know um, that was done by Mike Legan and McDonovan down the uh, in the yard down here in Moor Park. Those of you that were listening to the dairy conference um, there in late November, early December, will have heard uh, William Burchill, my colleague, talking about uh, farm gate nitrogen use efficiency. The other thing that you'll have heard is Jack Nolan really throwing down the gun to, to, to us as farmers to um, try and spare chemical fertilizer uh in the next 12 months in particular i suppose or to start making the change anyway and what jack was suggesting is that people would try to save a bag of nitrogen basically a bag of can was what he was he was suggesting so 26 or 7 units of nitrogen to be saved during the course of the year so we're going to start trying to i suppose again like i said at the outset i don't think the advice that we've given down through the years is all that different it's probably just emphasizing a few points in particular in relation to it uh, to make sure that we don't uh, have run into trouble with the, the likes of the EPA in relation to water quality and so forth. So there's water quality is a bit static at the moment. We're, we have a, an obligation to try to improve water quality over the next number of years. Uh, and part of that is going to be around fertilizer and slurry usage. So just in terms of farm gain, gate nitrogen use efficiency, William would have, as I said, spoke about it in a, briefly in a video at the dairy conference. And we would have also covered it uh, last September when we were on Jimmy Cotter's in Coachford uh, for the farm walk that we did there through, through Let's Talk Dairy. But basically the situation is that nitrogen is recycled within the farm, depending on um, what way we're applying it and we'll say so you've nitrogen coming in the form of inputs so you can see at the top there you have the fertilizer spreader so that's the one that probably springs to mind straight away when people think of nitrogen is obviously chemical fertilizer but there's also nitrogen in the form of the, the protein levels and that's why we have talked about reducing protein levels in grazing diets uh, because that nitrogen that's coming in and feed is also part of the nitrogen that's cycling in the farm and then also obviously you have what the, the stock are producing as they so they're, they're consuming grass maybe that has been grown by the fertilizer nitrogen they're consuming the nitrogen that's in the concentrate that they're being fed and they're shedding some of that out through uh, dung and urine uh, and that's obviously been cycled around through the soil as well 
So that, that's the, they're the inputs. The outputs then are obviously milk in particular and stock sales themselves as well. So obviously uh, they're converting it into, into growth and, and that means that the, they're con using up some of the nitrogen. So the, the nitrogen in the feed and the nitrogen in the grass that they're consuming, but they're obviously passing some of that through the system as well. So that's been recycled back into the, into the, um, into the environment. And the efficiency with how that happens then is, is probably one of the, is the critical thing, I suppose. There's an industry target there, 35%. Um, so that's basically saying that 35% of the nitrogen that comes through the farm is, is recycled or is um, retained, we'll say, or is, is achieved, basically. So that you're recouping 35% of it in the product that's going off the farm in the form of the milk or, or the, um, the livestock being sold off of it. So it sounds ambitious. I suppose Jimmy's figure for back in last September was 29%. Uh, one of the things that was influencing Jimmy's figure was probably the fact that he was contract rearing his young stock. So he had high output because of high output milk herd, all cows on the platform. So that was helping his situation, but it's still quite a good figure. The National Farm Survey figure would be somewhere in the region of 25%. And I'm just going to show you some other figures then. So you can see there that down at the bottom, 24% is the National Farm Survey figure for 2019. But you can see that it is quite achievable to push that 35%. Like some people wonder, is that a bit of a stretch target, as they say? And it's not necessarily. So it's 40% um, achieved there in the 13 to 16 period in terms of the grass only trials in Moor Park. And obviously then uh, Clover is replacing a lot of the chemical nitrogen coming in on the, on the 150 trial. Um, and we were up on 60%. And Deirdre Hennessy would have spoken about that. Um, at the, at uh, the IGA conference recently as well in terms of the recovery rate that we can achieve there. So the clover is, is providing the, the nitrogen through fixation uh, or reducing down our bag fertilizer as a result. So obviously in the, the grass only scenario here, we were on a 250 kilos. So we saved 100 kilos on the clover 150 and the nitrogen filled the gap. And the milk solids yield, obviously, as we know from clover trials that we've been doing on multiple sites across the country, actually does increase milk solids production as well as helping to reduce the um, in usage on farms potentially as well. I suppose the, one, the big thing here is probably to note that the, the end surplus is dropping quite significantly with the, with the clover because we're not putting in that extra 100 kgs of nitrogen, okay? Uh, and obviously, National Farm Survey figure is only producing 10.5 tons of dry matter per hectare, whereas we equal performance in terms of our 250 kgs of nitrogen application rate and our clover 150 um, application rate in the, those clover trials, with the stocking rates being the same here at the 2.6 and 2.6, and same concentrates. So obviously, very controlled trial, and you can see that by just eliminating the chemical fertilizer, we can dramatically increase the the, the end use efficiency and reduce that end surplus. So basically what that end surplus means is that the, there's less nitrogen floating around in, in, the, in the soil, which has the potential to be leached or moved to ground waters and eventually end up in estuarine water. So the likes of um, Yall would be the one that would come to mind around here in particular because the black water and a lot of the rivers eventually end up in Yall. So estuarine water quality would be influenced by that flow of um, end surplus through farms as well. So I suppose just to look, there's no doubt about it. I think I'm, I've probably said it before. Dairy, we as dairy farmers probably are slightly like uh, drug addicts when it comes to nitrogen. We, we like it because it does exactly what we expect it to do. It does grow grass. So when we go back and look through the data going back 30 years nearly now at this stage and nearly more actually, um, McCarthy in 1984 reported that the, in, the date in spring at which a given grass yield is obtained could be brought forward by three weeks when end fertilizer was applied at the correct time. And that's three weeks of grazing at 10 kgs per cow per day. So I suppose what we're probably talking about here in, in the main is actually responsible nitrogen use uh, really for the springtime because there's multiple um, studies there that will show that there is a, an economic response to using the nitrogen. So we have to be just conscious of the environmental issues around it as well. So spring nitrogen supply, I suppose low emission slurry spreading is, is something that's becoming more and more common, really common uh, um, around here in, in the Moor Park area because we have a high number of derogations in the, in, the, in the region and low emission slurry spreading has been part of that. So it was, it was uh, forced upon people in many cases 
Um, but it's been a, a positive in one sense, I suppose, from the point of view of that it allows us to recover more nitrogen from our slurry, which helps us to reduce our chemical nitrogen inputs, which subsequently influences the nitrogen surplus on the farm and uh, also influences the in efficiency or the, the nitrogen use efficiency on the farm. So from, from the point of view of nitrogen supply for the spring, we're going to be looking at the way we can use that low emission slurry spreading because of the advantages that it gives us over splash plate in terms of potential to graze it in, in relatively short periods of time post application. We're going to look at the first split of nitrogen, the second split of nitrogen, a kind of a supply demand situation in terms of how that influences growth or the nitrogen usage and then monitoring regrowths. And obviously we have to look at the rainfall and the soil temperatures. So there's a, a useful, if you Google remote signals, soil temperatures, um, it should bring you to a map that will more than likely have a, um, a location not a million miles away from you that you can get data back on the soil temperature in the region. So the soil temperature, when I looked at it this morning for the Moor Park area is actually quite good in spite of the, the cold weather that we had last week. Um, but actually not too far away as we move back towards Mallow, soil temperature was uh, a little bit in the lower side back around there. So I suppose people have to make a calculated um, guess, guesses is the wrong, uh, calculated decisions is, the, is what I'm looking for in relation to applying nitrogen at this time of year. Uh, even though there's no doubt about it that there will be a response to it, we just need to be careful when we put it on, okay? So slurry and its use. The, um, there's potential for significant losses when we use it, uh, use splash plates. And you can see there that the average loss is probably f is in the region of 54% of the nitrogen, uh, giving us an average retention rate of 46%. Whereas when we use trailing shoe and that kind of, it can be the dribble bar trailing shoes, either are, dribble bar tends to be probably more common. The loss rate is obviously reduced. Um, and we have an average loss in the region at 35%, which means that there's almost 20% more of the nitrogen being retained uh, in the slurry by virtue of the fact that we're applying it through the low emissions. And look, there's no doubt about it from a public perception point of view, the application of slurry with low emissions slurry tech or low emissions technology, so your dribble bars and your trailing shoes and your slurry spikes, etc., is really positive from the point of view of reducing um, ammonia loss, both from the point of view of um, the target to reduce ammonia loss, but also from a reduced level of smell because of that reduced ammonia loss, which is obviously very important from a public perception. So just what's it worth, I suppose. The splash plate you can see there is the equivalent of a bag of 5532. And when we use the, the trailing shoe, and I suppose shallow injection is in there, not something you see a lot of in Ireland because of the stony nature of the soil. It's uh, increasing the nitrogen value. You see there's really no impact um, if you can see the mouse moving there, there's no impact in terms of the P and K content of the slurry by using the low emissions, but where we're getting the gain is in relation to that nitrogen aspect. So it's, it's, it's tying back to this average loss rate versus the average loss for the, the uh, splash plate. We're gaining four units per thousand gallons in this, in this situation. Um, and then with the shallow injection, there's a little bit extra there, but um, as I said, it's not a very common... Um, method in the country because of the soil type. It's much more common in the, the likes of Holland and so forth where they have more sandy soils. It's a lot easier to use shallow injection in that scenario. So spring, um, just try and remove this here now. It's so spring, we're recommending that uh, people would consider using two and a half thousand gallons per acre. Uh, that's the equivalent of 23 kgs of nitrogen per hectare. So what does that convert to into units per acre you're talking about? somewhere in the region of, you multiply it by 0.8 basically, so 2.8, 16, 3.8, 24, you're looking at 19 to 20 units of nitrogen per acre uh, when you use 2,500 gallons of slurry per acre in, by, and, and it's applied through low emissions spreading uh, equipment, okay? So use instead of nitrogen fertilizer on up to two thirds of the milking platform. So I suppose, again, if I refer to William, people that know William and have been at discussion groups with William Burchill, William always talks through the calculation at this time of year in terms of the nitrogen that's actually required by the grass that's going to grow between here and the start of the second rotation. And I'm not going to go through it here now, but if you, if you do the sums, basically, if you have any concern that your 20, 23 units of nitrogen isn't going to be adequate to uh, grow the, that grass that you're hoping to grow between here and the start of the second rotation, if you see William doing that calculation, it'll put your mind at ease very much. So 
you couldn't early argue that the, the, the two and a half thousand gallons is going to pr produce a little bit of surplus even in, in that sense. So it'd be under no illusion, I suppose, that you can quite easily use slurry to replace a proportion of your nitrogen fertilizer that may have been going out. And as I said, the, the advice that I'm given here now today isn't really changing from what we would have suggested in the past, but we're just emphasizing it a small bit more. And the big change that we're probably emphasizing here is that there is probably a chance that people were people were applying the slurry for definite because obviously tanks had to be uh, or being emptied and, and lowered at least uh, in the springtime. But, but people were probably coming on with a half bag of urea on top of that so that there was 40 to 46 units of nitrogen out on grassland in the early uh, part of the spring that there is no requirement for in terms of nitrogen demand by virtue of the grass that's going to grow in the period of time that it's it's been applied. So the objective would be that in January or February, obviously, the depending on location, that's going to dictate some of it. And obviously, soil type will dictate it as well. So maybe even though you might be in a period in an area where you're no longer required to keep your slurry uh, in your tanks, you may be on ground that isn't going to be trafficable and it may not be suitable to actually spread. So it may be February before you're going with slurry. And the objective would be then that you would cover at least a third and potentially up to two thirds of the milking platform that has the lowest covers with slurry at that stage. And then in February and March, again, we'll say so there's a bit of an overlap there, especially on the farms that can start grazing in February. As you graze off your 30%, you're creating a bit of ground that you could travel with slurry and that can be used there again. So if it's basically what you're looking at is trying to replace a half a bag of, of urea on uh, your grazing platform at least in the first round and and what that does then is obviously it's nearly achieving the objective that Jack Nolan had set out at the dairy conference last year almost in one go and then we can deal with kind of reducing nitrogen rates during the course of the, the summer and and the season later on in due course but just to if you use slurry on grassland uh, this spring and it's applied no matter what way it's applied really but you're going to get more nitrogen out there if you use it with low emission slurry spreading you don't need to follow with nitrogen on top of that for a, a good period of time. So we're we'll talk about the second split in, in a minute. So basically, if you were to cover two thirds of the, the block with slurry, it's the equivalent of reducing the, the nitrogen applied on the milking platform by 15 kilos of nitrogen per hectare in total. So it's going a nice bit of the way to reducing and achieving that, uh, that challenge that Jack has set. Similar to the soil, with the silage ground, obviously, if we can get the two and a half thousand gallons onto that as well, and we go back, I won't go back here now, but if we go back to the, the value of the slurry, so the 532 or the 632 in terms of the P and K aspect of that, that's critically important from the point of view of silage ground, especially from the K point of view. Uh, but there is a K, P and K requirement for silage ground. And many of you will be limited in terms of the P allowances in particular that you have. There's no limit on K allowances, obviously. But if you can get uh, K, uh, P and K out onto your silage ground by using slurry, you can reduce down the P and K fertilizer requirement for that silage ground to grow the crop that you want to do. Again, just in relation to what you apply on the silage ground, like when we talk, uh, if you ask any of my colleagues that they'll often say to you that you need 100 units for first cut silage, and theoretically that's 100% correct, but you have to account for the slurry that's been applied in that situation. So if you apply 2,500 gallons of slurry, to uh, silage ground, you're looking at coming on with 75 to 80 units of nitrogen probably, not 100 units of nitrogen. And again, very quickly, we can save quite a significant amount of nitrogen if we just make that one change that we account for the, the, the nitrogen value of the slurry and reduce back the, the fertilizer, chemical fertilizer allowance um, accordingly. And re I suppose going back to maybe May, June, or April, uh, May, I suppose of last year, uh, a person would have commented to me that it makes very little sense in their head to pe that people are putting out so much nitrogen on silage ground on top of slurry and then testing silage to see is it fit to cut when the time comes because they're worried about the nitrogen. So we can grow quite good crops of silage, equally good crops of silage, I would say, um, and with, with lesser levels of nitrogen. So people needn't be all that concerned that they're cutting back on the chemical nitrogen. You're still going to produce enough silage. As long as you're cutting uh, the appropriate amount of silage ground for the, the farm that you're running, there should be no issue around um, silage stocks as a result of toning back the fertilizer piece. 
And I suppose Deirdre would have said this at the IGA recently, and, and it's an important point. Now, there's, there's a bit of a caveat with it, of course. If you are using low emission slurry spreading technologies, you should be spending, spending less, play on words there, obviously, on fertilizer. Now, fertilizer prices obviously go up and down, so that's going to, there's a bit of a conundrum in that. Um, but in, a, in an ideal world, if everything was equal and fertilizer price didn't change, the theory is that if you're using the low emission slurry spreading, you're actually taking out some of the nitrogen application that you're using on the farm. And as a result, you'll obviously spend less on chemical fertilizer. So that's a positive from a, an economic point of view, and it won't compromise you from a, a farming point of view. And it's obviously a very positive scenario from an environmental point of view then as well. So just some very recent results in terms of spring chemical nitrogen. I won't go through these in detail, but you can just see in terms of the yield response, some of the work that Mick O'Donovan did back nearly 20 years ago now uh, went as high as 16 kilos of dry matter per kg of N in terms of its response. You can see also that some, some of those, um, the, the application dates there are varying there, but you can also see that some of the work that Mick did there was as low as six. So there is, there is it's a risky, it's a risk, I suppose, or it's a challenge. Um, but there is scope there for using applications or using nitrogen to grow grass, like, like that uh, McCarthy statement at the start. Uh, and basically what this averages out at really is 9 to 10 kgs per kg of nitrogen applied. So what, as I said, we just really have to be smart about when we're applying it. So apologies for this uh, window that's popping up here, but basically this is just a nitrogen plan for drier soils. So what we're suggesting here um, is that cattle slurry can be used on up to two thirds of the platform. The balance of the area is getting um, the urea in the form of protected urea, ideally. That's our objective to try and increase the, object, the usage of protected urea. And again, the dairy conference will have shown you information, and I'll show it to you in a minute as well, that there's no impact on grass growth uh, when using protected urea. So January, February, depending on the location, depending on the soil type, etc., we're going to use cattle slurry to uh, replace some of that nitrogen in the first round. We're going to cover the rest of the ground with our uh, protected urea. So we're targeting the lower covers, obviously with the slurry, just to give it a chance, obviously not to, even though there's a reduced level of taint with the low emissions, we don't want to be dirtying the grass because we don't want the cows consuming that. Uh, so we target those lower covers. So less than 600 to 800 would be the objective to travel with the slurry. Uh, then the second 33% of the farm is getting uh, 23 units of, of urea and the, the other third is getting it as well. So this can be interchangeable if you have a lot of ground that's there's scope to spread the slurry on and you need the slurry on the platform, you could uh, use the slurry over the whole lot of that area. Then for the second run of, of nitrogen, what we're talking about is that you're going to use slurry again or 40 units of, of, of protected urea again. So the portion of the farm that has gotten the slurry is going to get straight urea, uh, or sorry, protected urea. So up to 46 units of that there going out in that situation. The parts of the farm that got 23 units then and then get slurry subsequently. So this is your first 30% of the grazing area that's grazed. Um, you, you're going to put slurry out in that hopefully and then you're going to top that up with 26 units of protected urea again. So you can see what we're trying to get here. Anytime you use slurry, you're cutting out the, the, the chemical aspect that you're, you're using here. So we've, you, we've put out 46 units of nitrogen here. We've put out somewhere in the region of 20 to 23 here already. So that's bringing us up to our 66 units by the 1st of April. And look for, for simplicity, we say 70 units by the 1st of April. Um, and that's everything in. So I suppose the reason I said that the advice hasn't changed, we've always been recommending 70 units by the 1st of April, 100 units by the 1st of May. Uh, but we've probably been remiss a small, a small bit maybe, or we've made the assumption that people understand fully that that's including the slurry. Uh, and that hasn't been the case possibly. It's been 70 units plus the slurry. So we've been probably closer to 100 units per acre in a lot of cases by the 1st of April and up on 130 units by the 1st of May. And that's just create, putting nitrogen into the system that isn't going to be used up at that stage and get, is increasing the potential for that to, to be lost to the environment. So uh, just to emphasize again, so we've put out our half bag urea on the, the, the grassy areas of the farm where we're not going with the slurry. We're following that then with 22,500 gallons of slurry when we've that grazed in February. 
And we're topping it up then with 23 units to bring us up to our 66 units here in total. And the rest of the farm then is getting the 46 units as well, so that we're trying to get most of the farm into a situation where it's up at that 70 units by the 1st of April. Now, that's not uh, an, uh, that doesn't have to be an objective necessarily because the vast majority of farms will have wet spots and dry spots. Not every farm is a perfect farm. So uh, that it, you don't have to have the 70 units out by the 1st of April on maybe slightly heavier soils, etc. Okay, so we just look at the... The heavier soils scenario, very similar, but a later start date. All the principles are the same. We're going out with our cattle slurry. We're going with maybe slightly higher level of nitrogen uh, because we're going that little bit later. Uh, and we're not aiming to have huge quantities of nitrogen out by the 10th of April. If we think about the belly haze situation, belly haze grows as much grass as curtains, but it just grows it at a different stage of the year. Um, and that's because it's a colder nature. Uh, grass doesn't start to grow as quickly in the springtime. So there's no point, nitrogen isn't going to make it grow any quicker because the the, implication, the problem for it is probably that it's, as Deirdre described it, is, it has cold feet. It's in, in damp conditions. It's not inclined to kick off. Soil temperatures are low. There's no real drive in grass. But then once we get out into, into the summer and soil temperatures pick up, there's great scope for grass growth on the heavier soils. So we're talking about, I suppose, um, more tailored advice, and this is can happen within the farm as, just as easily as it, as it can happen from, from farm to farm. So as I said, if there are wet portions on farms, tone it back and go at the lower levels and you won't, um, we won't lose any grass as a result of it. If, if anything, you'll save money potentially on it. So again, just putting this into context of how you can make your decisions, we'd be advocating that people would try and get out there uh, and get a walk done before um, cows go out to grass, obviously, soon enough, hopefully in some of the drier ground. Just it will quickly help you to identify where you can go with the slurry uh, or where you, where you should be targeting your, your urea. So obviously the, the lower parts of the farm it covers somewhere in the region of 600 to 800 targeted with the slurry. And our objective then is to cover the rest of it with the nitrogen when the weather is appropriate. Just coming back to the protected urea, the, all I want to show here is basically that we have compared on multiple sites now at this stage, and we're continuing this work on your Murray's continuing this work with Brian McCarthy for the coming year, and Belly Hayes and Athen Roy are also being brought into it um, in terms of the sheep ground in Athen Roy is going to be part of it as well. So we'll have a good extra um, build up of knowledge in terms of the locations and using the different products. So we can see that we have Ken here. The NBPT is our protected urea. This is the one that we're just happen to be testing. There are other formats out there now as well. And just recommend that anyone that is buying protected urea that you check with ourselves that the, the product that you're buying is actually on our recommended list of protected ureas because they're not all the same. And this is a straight urea situation. So you can see that we have little or no difference basically in terms of growth by using the different products, okay? So, um, just to give people confidence that it's safe enough to use the protected urea if you haven't tried it. We've been quite successful in some of the parts down and south uh, in terms of the uptake. There's been quite a significant uptake in some of the co-op regions. We need to get that up across uh, a lot of other regions. From an ammonia point of view, it's a big win and an easy win for, for agriculture. And agriculture is very much guilty of being responsible for a lot of the ammonia emissions. So our low emission slurry spreading and switching to protected urea are two things that we can do quite easily that will help us in this regard. So just to summarize on the spring nitrogen, soil temperature and rainfall are critical. So obviously we shouldn't be spreading in very wet conditions or if there's yellow warnings in place for within 48 hours, we shouldn't be spreading slurry or fertilizer of any sort really. Soil temperature being quite low, maybe if there's a period of cold weather coming again now, it might be advisable not to spread for a while, uh, again, until that soil temperature starts to pick up again. Um, challenge being obviously that ground conditions become dry when the weather is harsh, but the, uh, the likelihood of losses is, is, is high when there isn't a, a demand for it. So fertilizer when soil temperature is greater than five degrees plus and the land is trafficable. So be it that it may, you may have to delay applying your fertilizer Target the pad paddocks that will respond. That's probably important as well. So if you have an entire farm of very old uh, grass, it's not likely to respond to fertilizer in the springtime. And any of you that have reseeded ground will have seen that, that the, the level of growth that you'll see in the springtime on reseeded ground and even in the back end of the year will be far superior on uh, reseeded ground, obviously, compared to old perennial dry grass, old, old dry grass and old 
maybe not so much ryegrass swards as well that are out there. Drier ground obviously is going to respond because, as I said, the, the feet won't be cold, so the roots will be nice and warm and there will be more of a response. Uh, and a bit of cover is obviously helpful as well because that will help to maintain soil temperature to a certain degree, even in frosty conditions. So just, I suppose, that that kind of does mean, and it, it makes it tricky now as we come into calving, I suppose. Uh, in the past, people probably jumped into the tractor, threw on the spreader, covered the whole farm and got it done before cows started to calve. In reality, that's probably not the right approach unless you have a super dry farm um, that's uh, going to be able to respond to the fertilizer. We're probably looking at doing this in, in blocks, maybe as the as the day length increases, um, water table starts to drop a small bit maybe, and soil temperature increases as well. So we're recommending this NBPT, so that's protected urea. We'd be recommending that you go to 30 kgs is the equivalent to 23 units basically. So we're talking about a half bag of protected urea to be used. You can get these responses of, I think for simplicity, just think that you're going to get 10 kgs per kg of N that you use. Um, good recovery on those from the work that Michael and his team have been doing. Then in terms of that slurry application, use it on the paddocks that are of covers and that's, I think you can push it maybe a little bit to 600 to 800 potentially. And then for the second slurry application, use the slurry on the early graze paddocks. Um, because as we move into the latter part of the first rotation, obviously we're getting a little bit close to um, grazing the ground again quickly. Uh, so we don't probably want as much slurry in the, in the system at that stage. Um, the other thing would be that we would probably be looking at having the slurry going to the silage ground as a preference over the milking platform unless there are major P's and K's, def, P and K deficits that have to be dealt with on the platform first, okay? So just to, uh, to re-emphasize, we're talking about 70 units of slurry and chemical, not just chemical nitrogen, by the end of the first week of April there across the vast majority of farms or, or the, the drier land. And it's a small bit later and a small bit lower um, in terms of the, the heavier soils, okay? So um, farmers should be trying to use contractors for slurry and nitrogen now that's one way of getting around the, the situation and sometimes that, get, that can suit the guys that are spreading fertilizer to, to maybe come and do different bits of the farms for people so that they get around to a lot, a lot of people in a short space of time rather than getting to a few people. Um, the economic response is good um, and break even at, at worst. Getting the slurry out early is important from the point of the end recovery in it as well as the aspect from the, the low emissions but please just use your judgment and I, I, I trust in people's judgment to be fair that people know when and when they can't travel on their farm um, with nitrogen. And obviously, logically enough, if you can't travel, there's no point in, in trying to spread either nitrogen or slurry. So um, using the protected urea is something that we really, really are trying to push with people. So cons to consider that for, for 2021, um, to try and get that usage of protected urea up so that the department records will reflect that and that we will get the benefit of it in terms of the... Um, the credit that's going for it in the in the inventories in the, at the end of the year, and then there's going to be a nitrogen planner in the PBI this spring that that Michal and Joe Dunphy and John Douglas will probably be talking about as part of webinars, or I might get them on here to talk about it when it's up and running, um, in the next couple of weeks. So that's um, that's I'll stop that there now. So I have a couple of questions. In at the moment, so Dennis Guyer is just asking if soil temperature is below six degrees. I suppose Dennis, the, the angle that we'd be taking there is that it's probably not appropriate um, to to be applying fertilizer if if there's a prolonged period of of that temperature likely, and that you probably would be waiting for temperatures to be at least on an upward traje trajectory in order to um, go with nitrogen. Uh, what effect has this on nitrogen uptake? I'm not 100% sure now. That probably came in at some point there. The 100 units of nitrogen and expected growth slash slurry application would be more so based on receded ground rather than old swards. Would old sward need different application? That's a question from Justin. Yeah. Um, I suppose, uh, I think to be fair, Justin, that the, there's probably, that I presume that's in relation to the silage ground that you're talking about. Uh, receded ground would actually have a higher um, requirement, or oh, I'm sorry, maybe maybe you are talking about the, the, the grazing block as well. Um, the older ground obviously won't respond as, as rapidly in the early part of the season, just like I said there a minute ago that, about the perennial ryegrass swards. So older ground won't respond as much to nitrogen 
in the shoulders of the year. So all the ground probably I, I possibly consider running on that um, heavier soils program, maybe in terms of fertilizer on that if you don't have a lot of reseeded ground. And in terms of silage ground, then there probably uh, is a scope for a slightly higher level of nitrogen usage on silage ground for reseeded ground. But I don't think that it's absolutely necessary. I think uh, your slurry and your 75, 80 units will grow a good crop of silage for you, without, um, uh, which will meet a nice balance between quality of silage, which is something that we have a major challenge with here in, in this country. As far as I can see, we were obsessed with trying to grow huge crops and then are disappointed when the, the yield or the quality of the silage is poor when it comes to feeding it out. So uh, little and often is, is a better approach, I suppose. I think maybe a third cut of silage potentially, if you're worried about content or, or a quantity of it, might be a better option than going for massive um, big cuts, which have long leg phases after they're cut. So if you've stubble grown for two weeks that is doing nothing for you, uh, the quality of that silage is going to be very questionable um, that you've cut from it. And then obviously there's a leg then as well in terms of that ground lying idle for a period of time um, that it's really doing nothing at peak growing season, really. If you don't have enough slurry, Sean McArdle's asking, uh, is it better to target the silage ground? Yes, Sean. Yeah. Um, if we go back to to Stan Lawler's recommendations from a couple of years back, we would uh, we would have always been advocating that. So there's a, a little diagram there that you do your soil tests, you identify where your weaknesses are, you target your P's and K's issues, which are slurry in particular, and if that is silage ground, which the likelihood is, it's going to be in a lot of cases, target that with your, your slurry. Um, balance it with fertilizer then to, to keep making up the, temp the, the differences if, it, if there are any differences and I suppose to use your chemical then maybe on your grazing ground potentially if if there is a requirement for it. Um, again I suppose just be conscious of where bales come off the, the platform that there is a requirement for some slurry to go out there so um, in order to put it, make up for the K or else there will have to be uh, K put out in the form of murate or a good fertilizer that you could be using during the main season would be 29014 plus sulfur, uh, which is a protected urea product, which is an advantage again, obviously, from the point of view of using the protected urea. And it's obviously dropping in that bit of K there on an ongoing basis as well. So we have a lot of people that get concerned about high levels of K and the, and the impact that that can have in terms of technique, uh, especially at this time of the year, but um, just even applying high levels of K in the back end of the year for the subsequent year in terms of technique issues. So if you want to try and be working away on it, little and often 29 out 14 um, would reduce that big surge of K that you'd have to apply then at the at the end of the year to try and get your indexes straightened out. So yeah, I suppose Sean, that's a good point. Target the slurry uh, and that that's something that can be a bitter pill to swallow in some cases for people where because more and more of you are now 100% milking platform at home and silage is coming from out blocks and that could be coming a distance and there's a cost associated with moving that slurry to that distance. What I would say to you is probably think of it in the context of that if you move the slurry out to that out block there's a reduction in the fertilizer that has to be um, bought for that then as a result uh, whereas if you use that slurry on the the milking platform, you're going to have to buy fertilizer to replace the P's and K's that you actually have on the farm that you are now maybe using inappropriately on your milking platform because it's not needed. Uh, and the other thing I would say is not moving the slurry out to the out block. The slurry still has to be put out. So there's a cost associated with spreading the slurry. There's a saving in using that slurry appropriately by sending it to the right ground on, on your farm. And if we do that, there's probably a balancing act that isn't as quite clear cut as oh, it's going to cost me 60 euros an hour to get this slurry moved out to the out block or whatever, 70 euros an hour. Uh, and I can get only one, two loads out in an hour at that. But if I spread it out here at home, I can get four loads out. So um, just be, just think about it in that sense. The temperature link, there's Podrick or Mark who's just asking and someone else is asking it again. So just Google, um, oh, it's after, I'm after, soil temperature, remote signals and soil temperatures. And it should bring you to um, a site that will bring, it, should, it, it, it will bring you to the site for the soil temperatures. You'll get a, a, a map of Ireland on that and you'll see the little pointers indicating. So we have one here in Fomoy. Uh, we also have one back towards Mallow. Uh, there's one down around the Clannacilty area and they're, they're just the ones that I probably look at regularly. There's some in South Tip, there's one in East Limerick. 
Um, there are obviously the catchment area that I'm working in the most, or that I look at most. But there's there are those those soil thermometers are basically in place across uh, the whole country there, so you can look at that. So um, I suppose I'm going to have to nearly wrap it up there because I'm another meeting myself now at eleven o'clock. Uh, if I just two more questions that I'll deal with. If you use low emission slurry spreading equipment and nitrous slurry nitrogen enhancing, will you get more efficient use of non slurry of no, of non slurry? Of in, sorry. Okay, so that's uh, I suppose it's basically the question is is uh, looking at using slurry enhancers or um, additives to try and improve nitrogen recovery. I suppose again I'll reference William and the William Burchill. William would have done a good share of this work in uh, Johnstone Castle in the last uh, in in the years before he left there a couple of years ago to join the advisory service and. Uh, Basically, the long and the short of it is we've no real evidence as yet that suggests that any of those slurry additives are, are very effective. And the ones that seem to be most effective would be acidification, which is done to a certain extent in Denmark. Um, but unfortunately, or I suppose, there's a significant risk associated with um, that acidification process. It's quite a dangerous product to handle, etc. Um, it's been incentivized, if I, I think, by the Danish government to, to try and reduce ammonia losses, etc. Um, but if, in theory, I suppose, if the if those enhancers did work and you were using low emission slurry spreading equipment, it would further increase the nitrogen recovery rate from slurry. So I suppose there look, there's work ongoing in those. There are products out there that, as yet, we don't believe are. Um, necessarily doing exactly what they say on the tin. I suppose the proof of the pudding can be in the eating. Some some people have have um, testimonials that they found increases and in, and improvements in especially in um, agitation cr characteristics of slurry etc. But in terms of nitrogen recovery, we have no scientific data within Chagas that shows uh, any major benefit as yet. Anyway. Um, and just one final question, what is the max K you should be putting onto silage ground if you're planning to cut six to eight weeks later to avoid high K silage coming in? So that's from Dara. I suppose, Dara, the, the recommendation is that you wouldn't um, apply a significant amount of K with just six to eight weeks going, so to, I suppose to, to cutting, because there is you're going to be in a period of high growth at that stage, and the K that you apply is going to get sucked up into the silage and basically come back and land in your pit or in your bale. So ideally, you would be trying to get your slurry out onto your silage ground as early as possible. And that means that you have a huge quantity of, of your K applied very early on. You're stretching out that period of time then to uh, which the, the silage is going to be cut. And, and in some cases, if you're on index one soils, et cetera, you may need to actually put in additional K in with the nitrogen when you are applying it. And yes, you're right, that is going probably going to be going on six to eight weeks before cutting, but it's going to be a smaller quantity of K and the risk of that coming back in, in the silage is going to be reduced. So if you have a high K demand for silage, try to get that slurry out there at the first opportunity and stretch out that window between cutting and application of the slurry. And that will improve the situation in regards to luxury uptake of K uh, and avoid scenarios around that. So look at, um, we're going to call it quits for today. I actually, I was, I, my Zoom was a bit cold getting started this morning. So I haven't, uh, I'll be back next week. I actually can't tell you what the topic is next week off the top of my head because I hadn't, haven't it to hand. But we'll be back again with something interesting anyway, I'm sure, for, for to uh, enlighten you further for the spring ahead. So thanks for joining in today. Um, cows are starting to calve on farms around the country. Best of luck to everybody that's uh, listening in. Um, mind yourself, take care and be careful. Think safety all the time. Probably something that I don't mention enough. Just uh, be aware that cow, around the time cows calve, they obviously can be nearly more dangerous than bulls, uh, John McNamara would say. So just be careful out there. And obviously, in light of the COVID situation, which is quite rampant, as I said last week uh, as well, just be conscious enough that we have to be very, very careful uh, in our interactions with people. So vets, etc., coming onto the farm, obviously they're going to be going from farm to farm. They have an increased risk of con contracting COVID themselves. Um, but they're going to continue to offer their services, obviously, as much as possible. But we have to help them in every um, way that we can by trying to keep our distances and so forth. So everybody take care from a farming perspective and from a COVID perspective. And we'll see you next week. Uh, thanks for everything. Take care. Bye bye. That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. 
and don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday, so do listen in then. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and thanks for listening.